From the very beginning, the office of king has been a sacred one, where every king worldwide has been considered the descendant of the original heavenly king, the universal monarch. In a very real sense, every king was not only a descendant of, but a reincarnation of the original universal monarch. This heavenly universal monarch, as we have documented before, was the planet we now call Saturn. Kings throughout the ancient world and continuing into the modern world, while claiming ancestry to the original king, also imitated him ritually. Kings possessed the universal monarch's symbolic tokens which endowed them with the authority and power of the original. These emblems are called regalia, or alternatively, crown jewels. For example, the Egyptian kings wielded the sacred emblems of their exemplary first monarch, Osiris, these were the shepherd's crook and the flail. The famous stele of the Code of Hammurabi shows the king on the left receiving the scepter directly from the Saturnian god Shamash on the right. Normally, European regalia is composed of three items, crown, scepter, and orb. The orb is the globus cruciger, or orb and cross, Often it includes a sword, as the regalia of Hungary demonstrates. This set of regalia pieces, crown, scepter, and orb, extends back through the early European kings and into antiquity. It should not be surprising, then, that the Davidic kings possessed their own regalia and used them in their coronation ceremonies. As we noted earlier, the rabbinic midrash believed that Aaron's rod was used as a scepter as part of the regalia of the Davidic kings used in the coronation ceremony. The coronation ceremony for the Davidic line of kings is preserved in scripture. Before his death, David set the pattern when he had Solomon anointed king in his stead. David instructed Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet as to the particulars of the ceremony.
Other than the horn of oil from the tabernacle, there is no mention of the use of regalia in the coronation of Solomon. However, in a later coronation, that of Joash, regalia are mentioned, specifically the crown and what is called the testimony. We have previously identified the testimony as the stone tablets of Moses, which were placed in the Ark of the Testimony or the Ark of the Covenant. Many commentators and translators believe that the testimony given to Joash was a copy of the Covenant, as the New International Version indicates. But there are other interpretations of this verse and the event it describes. It is important to point out that in the original Hebrew, there is no verb immediately preceding the aduth, meaning testimony. So translators who assume that the testimony was given to the new king must insert a verb for the sentence to make sense. The King James Version inserts gave, the New International Version inserts presented, while other translations follow the same pattern. But if the original Hebrew is translated without assumption, then testimony becomes a compound direct object of the verb preceding crown. This would mean that the testimony, whatever it was, was put on or placed upon the king as was the crown. Some believe that this means the testimony refers to something that was worn, such as a royal robe or a religious phylactery. Some translations attach a more broad meaning, using insignia instead of testimony. Insignia would imply the royal emblems we now call regalia. The scepter has always been the primary symbol of Davidic and Messianic kingship, it was the scepter that was used to symbolize Judah's right of kingship in Jacob's blessing to his son. Psalm 45, one of the so-called royal psalms, used the scepter as the preeminent symbol of royal and messianic authority, calling it the right scepter. The Apostle Paul, in his epistle to the Hebrews, quoted this psalm and equated it with the kingship of Jesus Christ. Psalm 110, another royal psalm and a psalm of David, calls the scepter the rod of the Lord's strength, which gives him the right to rule. The Lord continued the theme of the scepter of righteousness in his revelations to Joseph Smith. The scriptures are full of prophecies promising that the throne of David would continue forever. The prophet Nathan relayed the Lord's promise to David that his kingdom would be established forever. The Lord confirmed this promise to David's son, Solomon. Jeremiah later reaffirmed the promise. Joseph Smith, in his dedicatory prayer for the Kirtland Temple, a prayer that was revealed to him, beseeched the Lord to break the yoke of bondage from the house of David so that it could reign once more. When the Lord returns to rule and reign, he will do so from the throne of David, as Isaiah famously prophesied. When the Lord
Lord does break the yoke off the house of David, he will raise up another David to rule as king. Joseph Smith elaborated on this Latter-day David in a Discourse to the Saints in March 1844. Our purpose here is not to discuss the details of the Latter-day Kingdom, a complex and significant topic for another time but to establish the fact that David's kingdom would continue unbroken until and including the latter days. From David to Solomon to his ancient heirs and to the present day, there has been a rightful heir to the kingdom, a direct descendant of the king. His royal lineage will continue and be restored to the throne when the Savior comes. When this second David becomes king, along with the authority of the original David, he will require the authentic tokens of authority, the Davidic regalia. The sacred tokens of Davidic authority, testimony, crown, scepter, or Aaron's rod, and the pot of manna, will be restored. It is the sacred regalia which established the divine king's right to rule. We have noted earlier that the rabbis are divided on the whereabouts of the Davidic regalia, specifically the Ark of the Covenant and its contents. Some believe they were taken and destroyed by the Babylonians, while others believe they have been hidden away. But the Lord considers the Ark, Rod, Manna, and Testimony to be sacred and essential to his future kingdom. When they fell into the hands of the Philistines, he did not suffer them to be destroyed. Instead, the regalia, specifically the rod, destroyed the Philistines. He also promised from the beginning that not only would the right to rule never be taken from Judah, but that the scepter itself would not depart. Both symbolically and literally, Judah's scepter would be preserved. The preservation of the scepter and other regalia required and requires a purposeful plan to hide and protect them from the people who would seek their destruction. This truth was made manifest when Babylon sacked Jerusalem and took away the furnishings of the temple. The adversary understands the importance of the sacred Davidic tokens and seeks to destroy them in his attempts to destroy the house of David and prevent its restoration in the latter days. The Book of Mormon provides a clear analog to the hiding up of the Davidic regalia. The kings of the Nephites took great pains to protect their own regalia, including their records, from the hands of the Lamanites and others who would seek to destroy them. Eventually, with the total destruction of the Nephite civilization, they were forced to hide them up into the Lord's hands. After Amaron, Mormon hid up the records in the hill Cumorah. He knew that if they fell into the hands of the Lamanites, they would be destroyed. The prophet Ether, living in an earlier civilization, hid up his records so that they would be protected until a righteous people would find them.
In a revelation to Oliver Cowdery, the Lord intimated that there are other records that have been hit up to come forth in our dispensation. In an earlier revelation to Joseph Smith, the Lord explained there were many records which have been withheld due to the wickedness of the people. It is a common pattern for the Lord to hide up sacred records until a righteous people exhibits the faith requisite for their restoration. Records are not the only sacred artifacts the Lord hides for future generations. We know from the Book of Mormon and modern revelation that certain artifacts were considered sacred enough to be under the charge of kings and eventually hidden up. These artifacts included what can only be considered regalia. The Book of Mormon identifies four specific items which became the sacred charge of kings. These items were passed from king to king along with a charge to keep them protected. King Benjamin gave a charge to his son, Mosiah, who was to replace him as king, to keep the plates of brass, the plates of Nephi, the sword of Laban, and the Baal or Leahona. These four items, along with the interpreters, constituted the royal regalia of the Nephite kings. Though there is no mention of a royal crown or scepter in the Book of Mormon, the Sword of Laban does fit the pattern of the Sword of State, and the Liahona, a ball with arrows, does fit the role of the Globus Cruciger, the Globe and Cross. But the significance of these sacred objects transcended the Nephite civilization. They were hidden up unto the Lord to be brought forth in our dispensation, the latter days. We know from his history that Joseph Smith received the gold plates and the Urim and Thummim from Moroni, the last Nephite caretaker of the sacred artifacts. As we know, Joseph used the Urim and Thummim to translate the record on the plates, which became the Book of Mormon. The sacred nature of the plates and Urim and Thummim was such that Joseph was forbidden to show them to anyone upon pain of death. should note here that the Urim and Thummim, unlike the plates, were not of Nephite origin. We first learn of them in the Book of Mormon, when the brother of Jared was commanded to seal up his record and the interpretation, to go forth only in the latter days. The point here is that these particular stones were not original royal regalia of the Nephite kings, but were adopted as such. As we shall see, this was true of the Sword of Laban as well, among other items of the regalia. We know from a revelation to the three witnesses that the Sword of Laban and the Liahona were hidden up with the plates and Urim and Thummim. In June 1829, the Lord promised to show them to the witnesses if they relied on his word with full purpose of heart. According to David Whitmer, one of the witnesses, this promise was fulfilled. In his canonized history, Joseph Smith described the repository for the plates, its location, and the process by which he obtained the plates, the Urim and Thummim, and the breastplate.
While the history is accurate, it is not complete. There is much more to the box and much more to its contents, which Joseph cryptically calls the other things. The box holding the plates, Urim and Thummim, and breastplate was much larger than Joseph Smith's history suggests. Furthermore, the box held much more than the items mentioned in the history. As other historical accounts record, the box was the size of a large room and was the repository of numerous records, among other things. There were several of the early brethren who were of the opinion that the box in which the plates and other items were deposited was, instead, a very large room that was located in a cave. President Brigham Young told the Saints in Farmington in 1877 that when Joseph and Oliver went to the hill Camorra to return the plates, the hill opened up, whereupon they entered the cave and into a large and spacious room. In an 1856 discourse, President Heber C. Kimball also reported that Joseph Smith and others entered into a cave in the hill Camorra where there were numerous records piled upon each other. David Whitmer, one of the three witnesses who saw the plates and the other sacred artifacts, stated in an interview in 1878 that the gold plates were in a cave, hidden up by the angel, presumably referring to Moroni. Orson Pratt called Joseph's stone box the Grand Repository and said that it was located in another department of the hill. The size of the stone repository was estimated to be 15 feet high and rounded on the sides apparently giving it the appearance of a cave. It only makes sense that the repository of the plates and the sacred objects be a large room and not a small box, since it had to hold all the records mentioned in the Book of Mormon. The Nephites were a record-keeping people, so there must have been many more records kept, which were not specifically named. Heber C. Kimball estimated there were more records in the room than ten men could carry, Brigham estimated that it would take many wagon loads to carry all the plates in the room. The repository also held the sacred relics. Additionally, according to a reported statement of Joseph Smith, the cave contained large amounts of unspecified treasure. Oliver Cowdery echoed Joseph's claim of treasure. It is obvious from the numerous reports, first-hand and second-hand, that there was a large cave-like room in or near the Hill Camorra. This room contained numerous records, the sacred relics of the Nephite kings, and a good deal of treasure. Certainly, this was more than a temporary holding place for items important to Joseph Smith and the Restoration. What, then, is this cave? In 1834, the Lord commanded the saints in Kirtland to organize and establish themselves into a united order. They were to do so for the benefit of the church and the salvation of men. A 
As a part of this order, the Lord commanded that two treasuries be built with treasurers appointed to keep them. The second treasury was designed to hold all the monies received from the order members according to their stewardships and the improvements on their properties. The first treasury was wholly different. It was consecrated unto the Lord's name and was to be called the sacred treasury of the Lord. The purpose of the sacred treasury of the Lord was to house what the Lord called the sacred things. The sacred things were the Lord's words and revelations and the fullness of his scriptures. The sacred things were stored in the treasury while they were printed in a printing office under the stewardship of Frederick G. Williams and Oliver Cowdery. The proceeds from the sale of the printed sacred things, called avails, were to be placed directly into the sacred treasury. The sacred treasury of the Lord was intended to become the repository of sacred records and monies. In other words, it became the repository of treasure, as its name implies. Whenever the Lord has organized his kingdom on the earth, he has established a sacred treasury. When the Israelites defeated the Midianites in battle, they took spoils, including treasures, gold, and jewelry. After taking their share of the spoils, the officers of the hosts offered a share of the treasure to the Lord as an oblation. The oblation was considerable, worth over 16,000 shekels. Moses and Eleazar the priest accepted the offering and placed it in the tabernacle of the congregation. The tabernacle, in effect, became a sacred treasury. By the time of Joshua, there was a specified treasury, called the Treasury of the House of the Lord. It was into this treasury that Joshua put the Lord's portion of the plunder from the conquest of Jericho. As the name suggests, the treasury was within the tabernacle. It is unlikely that a separate structure was erected within the tabernacle for the treasury. Rather, treasures were placed within the existing structure, most likely within the first and largest section of the tent, the holy place. Like the tabernacle itself, the treasury was a temporary holding place. When a permanent temple was erected, the treasury also became permanent, with a designated room or rooms in the temple. According to the plan given to David by the Lord and then passed to Solomon, the new temple included multiple treasuries. It is unknown which rooms were specifically designated as treasuries, but it is likely they were some of the chambers round about the sanctuary.
Treasuries continued throughout biblical history. After the fall of the kingdom of Israel and the reign of the idolatrous Ahaz, King Hezekiah of Judah built treasuries as a part of his national renewal. The treasuries were pillaged by Nebuchadnezzar who took all the treasures from the temple and carried them off to Babylon. When the Jews returned from the Babylonian captivity, Nehemiah directed the treasuries to be cleansed and reinstated as repositories of the sacred vessels. Nehemiah also directed that they be used to store the tithe of corn, new wine, and oil. The temple treasury continued into New Testament times as we learn from the story of the widow's mite. 